if you'll open your Bibles today to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. There's books there. Open to Titus 2. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nope, we are in Titus chapter 2. We normally save verse-by-verse uh, -verse study for Sunday evenings. However, with uh, Dad out for the next few weeks, um, we are sneaking in the book of Titus. We've preached through the majority of the New Testament, except for Titus and the Timothys. So Titus is only three chapters. I had a three-week spot here. So we are sneaking in the book of Titus. Now, we believe that all Scripture is written for our benefit. All Scripture is written for us. But not all Scripture is written to us. We are in what's called an epistle, a letter. And the letters to the churches, and the letters to the pastors, were those set up and written directly to churches for church doctrine, for understanding. These are direct applications for New Testament believers. Like the sacrifices in the Old Testament, we gain understanding of the ultimate sacrifice. But as far as the letters, the epistles, they are directly for church doctrine, procedures, and actions as we live in the New Testament times. Now, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, they were different as far as the epistles as they were not written to a whole church, but to individual leaders or pastors within churches. Now, the theme of Titus is the unbreakable link between faith, practice, and behavior. That belief and behavior are related. That faith and practice are, un, are an unbreakable chain. Now, Paul is taking this time as he's writing the pastoral letters, giving criticism to false teachers and prophets. And he's giving instruction in Christian living and standards set for church leadership. Now, some may say that Paul and James have a disagreement as Paul very much stresses this perspective of from faith. And James stresses action. However, I think when you read the book of Titus, you see that there is definite harmony between both the message of Paul and the message of James. Two different notes that blend together. That's what we call a music harmony. And Paul and James are in perfect agreement or perfect harmony. And it's brought out very clearly in this book of Titus. In our very first verse of this book of Titus, Paul outlines a very simple but effective understanding of the life of the believer. Titus 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords to godliness and hope of eternal life. This very simple but effective progression of the Christian life outlined here. First faith, then knowledge, then godliness, then eternal life. Faith, knowledge, godliness, eternal life. The progression goes like this. We come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then we gain knowledge. And knowledge is not just book learning. But knowledge is relationship. You learn like you learn 
or gain in knowledge as when you have a close friendship with somebody. You gain knowledge between the two. It's the growth of relationship. And in this relationship, we are conformed to the image of Christ. And then we enter into the promise of our eternal life. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. This is a direct command for pastors to teach. To preach and teach is the primary mission of the church. We talked about this when we were talking on Wednesday night as we were going through the means of grace in our systematic doctrine class. That teaching and preaching is fulfillment of the Great Commission. It is the primary purpose of the church. It is our primary mission. And to preach is to proclaim or to share the gospel. This is sharing of the eternal life. However, teaching is sharing God's thoughts. And this is the sharing of the abundant life. Eternal life is by grace through faith. Nothing of works. Eternal life is a free gift. However, the abundant life, the abundant life is growing in knowledge in the Christian life. It leads to the abundant life. The abundant life is here and now. The eternal life is in the future. You cannot lose the eternal life, but you can forfeit the abundant life in our life now. Verse 2, older men be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and steadfastness. Paul begins this, the letter with the requirement of an overseer. In chapter 1. But he expounds here in chapter 2. To how the congregation should behave. Now we have the same progression of faith, knowledge, godliness, and eternal life. Older men cannot attain this behavior unless first they have faith in Jesus Christ. Then there has to be sound doctrine taught to these men that they can have knowledge and grow in relationship. After faith, after knowledge, we should see this transformation, not done in the flesh, but by the Spirit, this progression to godliness, as Paul describes here. Verse 3, Old women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train young women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Paul specifically pulls out here or highlights here that older women are called to be teachers. As sound doctrine is invested into the women of the church, it is the women of the church that become that second line of teachers and trainers in practical application of the abundant life of the believer. It is women, doctrinally speaking, that are called to teach. Verse 6, likewise, urge the young men or younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourselves in all respect to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. The common thread we see here between the old men 
which I'm part of that group. And the young men is self-control. Self-control is not a term that we use a lot in today's world. But the meaning of self-control is to have discipline. Living a disciplined life is a mark of holiness. Wesley, who some would say is the founder of the Methodist Church, this term Methodist was given to him almost as a mockery from other people because he lived a very methodic life. He was disciplined. He got up at a specific time. He studied at a specific time. He ate at a specific time. He went to sleep at a specific time. He lived a disciplined life in holiness. And men naturally hate, and all mankind naturally hate discipline. We live in a time where there's an abundance of food, a time that has not been seen throughout all of human history. We have people dying of too much food related sickness. It's unbelievable. Because with the abundance of food, it becomes a discipline to not eat too much. And when we are undisciplined, we become fat and unhealthy. Work has become very light. There is not much physical labor involved as in times past. And with this, we become physically lazy and weak. People have stress-related injuries from typing too much because physical activity is gone down and we become undisciplined in exercise. We live in a time also where any question you'd like to ask, you can speak it into a phone and it will give you an answer. And we have become a people of ignorance because of the lack of discipline. Verse 9, bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering, not showing all, not, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Many of the bond servants, or what we would call slaves, during this time in Rome, were people that took upon debt and could not repay it back. And not being able to pay their debts, they had to sell themselves into slavery to work off their debt. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rituals over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Today, if you were up to your eyeballs in debt, guess what? This portion of the bond servant, this is directed towards you. For the abundant life of Christ to manifest in your life, you need to work off this debt. And do it without resentment towards Mr. Visa or Mr. MasterCard. And to pay your bills in good faith. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Training us to renounce ungodliness and the worldly passions. To live self-controlled, disciplined upright and godly lives in this present age, the abundant life today, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the, of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. As we allow scripture to interpret scripture, Peter says the same thought in, in a little bit different way in 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of former, your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. This idea of holiness is so misunderstood today. We do not have the meaning of holiness which they thought of during the time of this writing. Our chapel here, as we had mentioned, Wesley, was a Wesleyan church at one time. And their idea of holiness was that women would not cut their hair and they would wear skirts. And that men, your holiness was based upon whether your hair touched the top of your collar or touched the top of your ears. Which has nothing to do with holiness at all. Because this meaning of holiness or profane simply means special or ordinary. And we are not called to be ordinary. We are called to be extraordinary. We are a special people. And faith leads us in a life. And life leads us to knowledge. And knowledge leads us in relationship. And relationship changes who we are. And these changes do not make us like the common man. It makes us special. In today's world, when a man in, wants to be engaged to a woman, he gives her a ring. And on that engagement ring, he does not put a piece of gravel like we have out here in our driveway. Nothing wrong with gravel, but it is common. It's not something of special value. But he takes a diamond, which is rare, which is special, and he has it set in a ring, and he gives it to his bride-to-be. As we strive to live the Christian life, let's understand that life has a progression. As Paul outlines in the very beginning of this book of Titus, Faith, knowledge, godliness, and eternal life. We come to faith in Jesus Christ through knowledge of the teaching of the Word of God. There is relationship built. Knowledge increases relationship. In that relationship, the Spirit is invested into us. And it conforms us. It conforms us to the image of Christ. This is godliness. Because there is no value in me trying to jump steps in the Christian life. There is no value for me to have standards and try to attain my flesh. Because they are useless without first faith, second knowledge and then being conformed to the image of Christ. And then we can enter into the promise of eternal life. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this book of Titus. Apply these things to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.